Hello and welcome to the bike show and our mobile studio, more commonly known as a van, which hopefully will have transported me to some sun and bikes in time for next week's episode. In the meantime though, Don gets to do even more riding than usual in the name of evaluating a test bike. Why would he do such a thing? Well, here he is to explain the testing conundrum with which he is faced this week. Here we have the BMW R1250 GS Adventure. It's like the normal R1250 GS except with more... moreness. And we've already done the normal GS to death on the show, so... What exactly do we do with the Adventure? The biggest difference, apart from more scaffolding and more suspension, is the fuel tank. It's 30 litres. That's a bucket load of fuel, if you can find a 30 litre bucket. So obviously if we have so much flammable liquid, it makes sense to use it. Well, what is our intrepid journalist going to do then? The answer is pretty simple really. Inspired by the kilometre crushing exploits of Bushy and his new world record from last week's episode, Don decides to try and make himself part of the brotherhood of the iron butts. And to achieve this legendary status, all he needs to do is travel a thousand miles, or 1600 kilometres, in 24 hours. Coincidentally, I've never been to the Kalahari metropolis of Uppington, and it just so happens to be exactly 800 kilometres from where I am. So we head out there, we come back, 1600 kilometres, no problem. Well, okay, there is a bit of a problem. You see, if we shoot this the normal way, uh, then we need a camera person, a camera car, uh, lots of U-turns, lots of different shots, uh, lunches. It's going to take forever. We're never going to finish in time. So instead, I'm taking a bunch of mini cams, one of these, and we're going to shoot this vlog style. Tomorrow morning, we go. And then, tomorrow morning happened. And so the journey begins. Naturally, the trip involved some sights, even if they are a little different. And coming up over here is Harder Pierce Point Dam. Although nowadays, with all the high surf going on, it looks a bit more like Harder Pierce Point Field. Game of golf, anyone? No time, because the clock is ticking and we have only just started. Uh, we're now on what's called the satellite road. Uh, they call it that because there's a whole lot of satellite dishes, pretty much. Uh, it's also famous among motorcycling circles because it's long and straight and empty. And, um, you know, motorcyclists like going long, straight, empty roads. Don't know why, don't know why that could be. This is my favorite part of the journey, by the way. We're still near the beginning. I'm still fresh, it's still exciting. Lots to come, yeah, let's do this. And this energy didn't change as we left the greenery of Harties and sped off into the flatlands that is the northwest province. Yeah, we're now just going past the town of Colini. Um, I don't know much about Colini except that, well, it looks like they sell tractors, which is good. Uh, but I'll, what I do like is the fact that it sounds like a smile. Stop the wind noise. This is obviously a relatively early start for Don and he's forgotten to close his helmet or adjust his mic so it's even more unbearable the wind noise than usual. Let me summarise though, he likes Kalini because it has a, an exotic silent G. With 200 kilometres on the clock he, being a world class mathematician of course, suddenly realises he's already one quarter of the way to his halfway turnaround point in Uppington. Although somewhat less encouragingly, he also realises that means he's only one eighth of the way into the total journey. He has also noticed that the 1250 engine is much better at long distance high speed cruising than the 1200 ever was. It sounds better, it is much smoother and with no annoying buzzing and so up until this point Don is very happy indeed. Eventually, after a refuel in Delareville, it was off to the halfway mark. Kinda. So here we go, we're just passing through Freiburg, 
Uh, this essentially marks 300 kilometers, 400 kilometers, sorry. This is my way. Um, so I'm still feeling pretty good. I mean, my butt hasn't turned all that iron just yet, but what, I, what is kind of worrying me is now we're heading into sort of the Kalahari Desert more kind of properly. It's now almost nine o'clock in the morning and we're just about to tick over to 30 degrees Celsius. I shudder to sort of think what the temperature is going to be a bit later on this afternoon. I'm already starting to take strain with this heat now. Oh, lucky I got a camel back here somewhere. <laughs> oh. It may seem ridiculous riding into a desert, but there's method to my madness. Of course, there's a very specific reason for heading west. Uh, obviously, when we leave in the early morning, the sun rises behind, which is great. I mean, it's not great for you guys because I'm sort of silhouetted the whole time, but it's really good for traveling. I'm never traveling into the sun, and on the way back, I should also have the sun behind me. West also means I head towards the desert, which means less rain. Less rain is obviously good. Um, saying that, there's some big clouds over there that's making me worry somewhat. Uh, ha! And then, the desert just sort of stopped being deserty. Ah, so good news, he said ironically. Um, it started raining. We're in the middle of the Kalahari Desert. It's raining, ladies and gentlemen. How funny is that? Uh, for you, not for me. Um, it does mean a pickle for me. It means I can't use any of these cameras. I can't use the sound of us because uh, they're not all that waterproof. I can use the GoPro, though, so you can watch me in misery on the GoPro. After a few minutes of treacherous misery, the desert came out again, and then a little gem. So here we are, we're in Kit 2. This is our last fuel stop. In fact, I've done two fuel stops on this whole journey here, which is pretty good. Uh, 30 liter tank, not bad. So this is Kit 2. It's actually amazing, this place, the way they've kind of built it up. It's, a, it's, it's like an oasis of civilization in an otherwise uh, barren desert. Um, but yeah, it's about 220 Ks now, final push. Well, final push until we're halfway. Mm, bit depressing when you put it like that, but uh, yeah, let's keep going. With fuel tanks and spirits revived, it was back to being all GSC. What's interesting about what's interesting about this GS? Okay, the wind noise picks up here again, big time. I think he's got crosswind, or a crosswind, or something. So let me just tell you that he's rabbiting on about the GS adventure, actually being in terms of a roomy comfortable riding position, more effective than many full-on road tourers. Although, in terms of wind protection, the GSA obviously doesn't come close to offering the same kind of calm, still pocket of air for the rider. And if you take a passenger into account, then, well, it's not even close. Four and a half hours down and Don is feeling very pleased with himself. And more importantly, he is experiencing the beginnings of a warm, emotional bond forming between him and the GS. While I was patting myself on the back, heading through more desert and more towns, something unexpected happened. Uh, this is a GS, but that's a dirt road. I don't think I'm supposed to be on a dirt road, am I? No problem. Punch Uppington into Google Maps, follow the directions back into town, and then... Okay. Looks like I've gotten hopelessly lost and I don't know how. Uh, the road has just come now to this dirt road. Somehow I went off the N14, I'm not sure how, I went straight. There were no big signs or anything that I could see. And now it says go down this road, four, 43 kilometers and we'll get back to the N14. It's been raining, it's wet. I'm on my own, I'm in the middle of nowhere and I have no idea how much cell phone reception I'm gonna have. I'm not doing 43 kilometers down this road. So I guess I've gotta go all the way back to the N14. It turns out, while playing around with cameras, I had somehow completely missed a turnoff and had gone 60 kilometers in the wrong direction. With an extra 120 kilometers under my idiotic belt, I eventually made it to the town of Olifant's Hook. What a pretty little town. And then had to make another fuel stop to make up for the extra mileage. Until finally, Uppington. 
Here we are, ladies and gentlemen. Look behind me here. That is the Orange River. That's the town of Uppington. That's the GS. Uh, one of the mightiest motorcycles in the world. The mightiest river in the country and uh, a lovely town. So now there's nothing for it but to uh, turn around and go back the way we came. Uh, well, the nice part about getting lost earlier is that now we're no longer halfway. We're more than halfway, which is good. But we're still 800 kilometers from home. Anyway, more bike riding, let's go. So now it's just the light task of doing 800 kilometers home. At least I now know when not to go to get lost. However, eventually, the mileage started taking its toll. Okay, we're now exactly 1,222 kilometers in. And uh, yeah, my, 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 the, the iron butt part of the iron butt part run is starting to set in now. Yes. I keep saying that they, sh you know, manufacturers need to make their seats better, you know, cozier, more comfortable. Like the car guys, their seats are usually very plushy and nice and everything. And the bikes, I don't know what it is, especially nowadays, it's like, nope, got to be rock hard. I blame cycling personally. But yeah, I'm starting to... <sighs> In fact, you know what? I've decided I'm going to do something I promised I would never do. <sighs> I'm a meerkat. Help me, I'm a meerkat. Oh, it feels so good though. Oh. After that sheer embarrassment and a much needed relief break, We pressed on with nothing going wrong at all. And then, with just 300 kilometers to go, the apocalypse loomed in the distance. Doom was imminent. A few final words were necessary. All right, as you can see behind me, the apocalypse is coming. It's gonna hit. It's coming from Botswana by the looks of it. <laughs> Okay, so I'm most of the way through this journey, so before night falls and, and apocalypse hits, uh, this GS, I mean, I've just done this whole run there and back, well nearly the back, uh, I don't know, the apocalypse is going to hit, prob I'll probably die, but up until this point, it has been charming, absolutely charming, delightful, smooth, blissful, sublime, whatever you like, all of those really, really nice words. If I were to give it a real criticism, the one thing I really still don't like is that gearbox, especially like first to second, second, third, it really kind of goes, Gwah, you know, uh, and that, that sucks when you're by yourself, it sucks more with a passenger. Although I'm trying to think why BMW would do that, and that's because I think they'd rather go for strong gearboxes than smooth gearboxes. I've got a feeling big chunks of metal clung together, that's what it feels like, and in a million years from now when their equivalent of, of excavators are going to be looking for stuff. They're going to find the petrified remains of a GS rider and a perfectly intact GS gearbox. That's still clunky. What I love about journeys like this is that when I was a kid and I was sitting in school, I mean, obviously I wouldn't listen to the teacher because it's boring as hell. Instead, what I would be doing is looking at my atlas. I had a school atlas. I didn't have cell phones in those days. But I used to look at the atlas and look at different places, like, you know, Cape Town, what's that like? I've never been to Cape Town, I've now been there, it's all right. Uh, all over the place, a funny place named George, huh? it's called George, that's the name of a man. Um, and, a, and a place called Uppington. Uppington, why is it called Uppington? What's so up about it? And it's on the Orange River, that's the biggest river in the country. And it's in the Kalahari, which is a desert, and it's, you know, you hear all these sort of, these, these sort of things that make you think. and. It's so great to be able to get on a motorcycle and actually go there. I mean, just to, even if it's just to say you've been there, it's like tick it off, it's a sense of achievement. And it's made even more a sense of achievement when you give yourself a kind of a challenge, like the Iron Butt Run, doing 1,600 kilometers or 1,700 and something, if you're like me and you get lost in 24 hours. It, it, it gives you this extra sense of achievement. Oh, Uppington, yes, I have been there. It was great. Oh, by the way, I went there and back in less than 24 hours. <laughs> that makes it that much more special. With that, we headed into certain death. And then... We did it! We did it! Yes! <laughs> um, 
1,733 kilometers, more than 1,600 because, um, well, yeah, I got lost. Uh, completed a time of, yeah, I should probably not say on um, national television, but it was less than 24 hours, fewer than 24 hours. So that would make me an iron butt holder, iron butt run holder, you know. If I had gone through all the paperwork and done all that, I would have a certificate. Um, just a little, few little things. I did survive the apocalypse. I'm very, very grateful. It was not fun, but I did survive it. Also, the GS, we originally said, the GS Adventure, we originally said, well, it's got a 30 litre tank, so let's go far. In 1,733 kilometers, I pulled up four times. Now, a more considered ride, it probably could have done it in three. A standard GS would have done it at least five. So definitely, definitely helped. So congratulations, I feel great. Well, I feel okay. I'm gonna go and be dead for like a couple of weeks. So if I disappear for like a month or so, don't worry about it. Brilliant effort there from Don, I think you'll agree. Although he seemed a little shy about the actual time, don't you think? Possibly because allegedly, though obviously with a healthy element of artistic license, your honor he might potentially have covered the 1733 kilometers in a shade over 14 and a half hours including all the stops which means his average speed would have been theoretically quite high <laughs>